الحمد لله الواحد الأحد الصمد الماجد الحميد المتحمد الذي لا تحيط به الأفكار ولا تنتهي به إليه الأسرار ولا تتركه البصائر والأبصار والصلاة والسلام على أبده الأعظم وحبيبه الأوحد ورسوله الأمجد وأمينه الأجود سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد المرسل الأكمل الأجمل الأفضل الأعظم الأكرم الأسلم الأحلم الأعلم مصدر الأمر والخلق ومبدأ الرتق والفتق ومنبع الجمع والفرق ومنزل النور والبرق هو الذي أخذ منه من الله تعالى وناتك عنه وشهد الله به وما ينتك عن الهواء هو إلا وحي الجوع صدق الله مولانا العظيم Respected Shuyukh Scholars and Honorable Representatives of Muslim Society Alhamdulillah Ta'ala by the blessings of Almighty Allah I feel honored to be with you in this great historic conference organized by our Afghan scholars, representatives with collaboration of George Mason University and Marmara University and with facilitation of other Turkish organizations and brothers belonging to different parts and sections of Muslim Ummah. No doubt this is a real representative conference of scholars, jurists and people of intelligence and prudence. Alhamdulillah, we are here to discuss a certain subject which has been educated to me and that is the relevance of religious text for justice and non-violence in Afghanistan. So this subject comprises three basic concepts. The first of all, which never occurred to me just one day up to one day before, that is the relevance or significance of religious text. While we are discussing the subject of justice, non-violence, peace, and a culture of dialogue, and a culture of peaceful future for Afghanistan. So, it starts what would be the relevance or significance of religious texts? I mean Al-Quran, Al-Sunnah, and Al-Fiqh, and al hikmah These are the basic sources, all known to be the basic religious texts. Second is the significance of justice, or relevance of justice in order to develop a culture or future based on peace, tranquility, tolerance, moderation, mutual understanding and an atmosphere of global human dignity. And third is non-violence. These are the three major issues which I am supposed to discuss in this sitting. Afghanistan as mentioned by our respectable host and organizer, no doubt is a great land of great Islamic and spiritual heritage and values. He mentioned some of the great 
in names of Islamic history in connection of Afghanistan and particularly Morana Jalaluddin Rumi who belonged to Balkh originally and Allama Jamaluddin Afghani. But I would like to add a few names and they would be just a few drops out of an ocean which belongs to historic, spiritual, academic, classical heritage of Afghanistan. And one of them is Hazrat Ibrahim bin Adam among the Sufiya. In the same way among the Sufi saints, Hazrat Shakik Balkhi Rahimahullah Ta'ala. One of the companions of Sayyidina Imam Jafar as Sadiq. In the same way, among the Sufiya, Khaja Muinuddin Sanjali al Ajmeri. And the one whom he got blessings from in Pakistan, known as Data Ganj Baksh, Sayyidina Ali al Ujwari, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, who belonged to Ghazni. Great Sufiya belong to this great heritage of Afghanistan, but the great scholar, the Muhaddisin, Mufassirin, and Fokaha also belonged and emerged from that historic, beautiful, spiritual land. And among them was Shaykh al Islam Abu Ismail Abdullah al Harabi. At the same time, he was the Imam of Sufiya and Imam of Muhaddisi. And he is the author of Manazir al the book whose commentary was written by Allama ibn al-Qayyim, a famous book, Madarij al commentary of <coughs> Manazir al <coughs> And Imam al-Harawi, the great Ravi of al-Jami al-Sahid al-Bukhari, if you go into the knowledge of Asanid and the Ruwaat of Sayy Bukhari, through which Sayy Bukhari was reported and communicated to our scholars all over the world. So you will find the great name of Imam al Harabi. He is the great Rabi of Jami as Sayy Bukhari, who belonged to Hirat, Afghanistan. Exactly, Mullah Abdul Rahman al Jami al Harabi and Muhaddis Kabuli. And one another famous name, and that is Imam Abu Dawood as Sijistani, the author of Sunan in Sihasitta. There are two traditions in the books of Asma al Rijal. One view is that Sijistan was a part of Persia, Fars, or Iran at that time. And other view adopted by some of the great scholars of Asma al Rijal. They say that Sajistan was a part of Afghanistan near the, the chain of the mountains of Kohinto Kosha. So he also belonged to Afghanistan according to one view. Which means that Afghanistan has produced great people in its history. So I hope this is our common duty to try to revive and restore this great Islamic and spiritual heritage of Afghanistan through our possible efforts, whatever we can do as our input in the whole process of bringing the peace back. As far as the relevance of the religious texts is concerned, I would mention just three basic texts. Although we are in a period of reasoning, science, and rational appreciation and analysis, and unfortunately, when approach, our intellectual approach, leads us or our thinking process to secular way of thinking and solving the issues. So we feel 
as if the religious texts revealed by Almighty Allah, they have become irrelevant. And we don't need to derive any kind of guidance from those divinely revealed texts. They are Al-Quran, Al-Sunnah, and Al-Hikmah. And I would say Al-Hikmah as Al-Fiqh, which is derived from Quran and Sunnah. Al-Fiqh is the Fahmul Quran and Fahmul Sunnah. And Quran declares it as Al-Hikmah. وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُ تَعْلَمُونَ So according to great scholars, the companions and their followers, تَعْبَيْنَ أَتْبَعُ التَّابِعِينَ and Aimma, as reported by Imam Bukhari in As-Sahih, reported by Imam Tarmi in As-Sunan, and many other books, they say Al-Hikmah, according to Imam Shafi and many others, which means Sunnah of Holy Prophet so these are the three major texts which derive from three major texts which derive from Al Quran, where Quran says, "Ya yuhaladina amanu atiul Allah wa atiul Rasul wa ulil amri minkum." This is the categorical place where Quran has emphasized on relevance of the texts. It would be wrong to say that only Quran has remained relevant for us in modern times. Or it would be wrong to say that neither Quran nor Sunnah or Al-Fiqh, none of them, has remained relevant in our present times because human intellectual process has taken lots of changes and alterations in our individual social, economic, political, philosophical processes of thinking. This would be totally a confusion. There is a continuity in every kind of reasoning, intellect, philosophy, scientific appreciation of the situation emerges, every situation emerges, which is known to be prudence and intelligence. It emerges out of the Quran and Sunnah. That's why these two sources are known to be everlasting till the day of judgment. Quran emphasizes on it by saying Atiullah Atiur Rasul by repeating the command Atiu for Rasul. It means as the obedience to Quran to Allah is permanent, absolute, unqualified, unchallengeable, uncontingent, <laughs> everlasting. In the same way, when the command Atiul Rasul has been repeated with Atiullah, it has not been stated Atiullah wa Rasul. But here, Quran says Atiullah wa Atiul Rasul. So, this repetition of the command of Atiul means that the Sunnah of Holy Prophet is also binding absolutely, unconditionally, uncontingentally. Permanently, persistently, unexceptionally, without any condition or context or pretext of times and places. So it will remain absolute and permanent, unqualified and unchallengeable in the same way as is the binding capacity of the authority of Quran. So there is no difference in authoritativeness of Quran and Sunnah as far as its originality is confirmed. The difference only exists in the grades. Khatib Baghdadi, he has mentioned, he has fixed a chapter in his books, At-Tasviyyatu Bain al-Quran wa Sunnah. And he says, that there is no difference between authority, original authoritativeness of Quran and original authoritativeness of Sunnah. The only difference is of the grade that we are supposed to take Quran first and Sunnah afterwards. Quran is the first source and Sunnah is the second primary source. But as well as the original authoritativeness is concerned and the binding capacity is concerned, there is a tasfiya We can't differentiate between them. Because 
in reality and then it is stated that is the third text and here lies the significance and relevance of al-fiqh and al-hikmah which comes after Quran and Sunnah and Almighty Allah has not repeated the command Ati'u for Ulil Amr. Ulil Amr means they are Fuqah, they are Aima, they are Aima Mujtahideen, Salaf Salihin, including the Islamic rulers and judges and courts. But Ulil Amr, their obedience has been declared as conditional, qualified. It can be challenged. We have a right to differ with them. But if any difference of opinion takes place between the followers or scholar and other scholars known to be Ulil Amr, here a permission has been granted of difference of opinion with Ulil Amr. But there is no scope or permission of difference of opinion with whatever is stated and commanded by Holy Prophet and in the same way as whatever is commanded by Almighty God. They are absolute binding. Whereas the commandment given by the Uli Amr is conditionally binding on him and that can be challenged. Then Quran has given a principle. If you differ with Uli Amr's judgments or decision, which is al-fiqh and al-hikmah, so what have you to do? <laughs> if there is any difference of opinion, then for final adjudication, you have to refer the case towards Allah and Holy Prophet, which means Ilallah means Ilal Quran. Or Ilal Rasul means Ilal Sunnah. So the final authority again rests in Quran and Sunnah together equally. These are the three sources Al Quran, Al Sunnah, and Ulil Amri Minko means Al Fiqh, Wal Hikmah. These are the three sources. And there are not many. Quranic verses which indicate the significance of the same thing. As Holy Prophet stated, Barawa Hazar Hadith Imam Ahmad fi Musnadi, but Abu Dawood fi Sunan, Wa Ibn Majja, Anil Mikdam bin Madi Karim, Kala Sidna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah inni hoti to the Quran, wa mislahu ma'ahu. Wa hakaza Rawa Abu Dawood wa Tirmazi, Kala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inna. ما حرم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم كما حرم الله تعالى وفي رواية قال إنما حرم رسول الله ومثل ما حرم الله تعالى لا يجوز أن يفرق بين ما حرم الله تعالى وبين ما حرم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وبين ما حل الله تعالى وبين ما حل الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يجوز أن يفرق بينهما لأن الله تبارك وتعالى قال is a arrafa khasiyyata rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fit tashiri laysa huwa al-amiru faqat wa al-nahi bal huwa al-muhallil wa al-muharrim ja'ad allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala lahu makanan makanan makanatul ula ja'alahu amiran wa nahiyan fi ma amarahu allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala wa al-hakam al-lazi hunzirat ilayhi wa ja'alahu shari'an وَلَيْسَ فَقَدْ هُوَ شَارِحًا جَعَلَ لَهُ شَارِعًا وَشَارِحًا إِذَا قَالَ يُحَلِّلُهُ الطَّيِّبَاتُ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهُمُ الْخَبَائِسُ وَلِذَارِكْ فَبَيَّنَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِنَّهُ قَدْ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى وَحْيَيْنِ وَهُمَا الْوَحْيُ الْقُرْآنُ وَوَحْيُ السُّنَّةُ هو وحي القرآن هو وحي متعبد بتلاوته ووحي السنة هو وحي غير مطلوب وغير متعبد بالتلاوة وهكذا صرح الإمام الأوزاعي والإمام حسن البصري إذا قال إمام أوزاعي عن حسان بن نتيجة فكان جبريل عليه السلام ينزل على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كما بالسنة كما ينزل عليه بالقرآن رباه الدارمي في سننه وهكذا جاء عن الأوزاعي قال سيدنا أيوب السختياني 
وقال اذا حدثت الرجل السنه وقال رجل اخر دعنا من هذا وحدثنا من القران هو يقول نحن لا نقبل اي شيء من السنه فحدثنا من القران من ايه من اي القران فاعلم انه داد مذل اخرجه الحاكم وصححه والبيهقي والخديب وهكذا سرها به الاوزاعي ومكهول ويحيى بن ابن كبير وهو قال القران اهوج الى السنه من السنه الى الكتاب لان السنه هي قاديه على الكتاب وليس الكتاب قاديا على السنه انزل الله تبارك وتعالى القران على النبي الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم ولكن ما جعل فيه شروحا وتفصيلا وجاءت السنه من عند النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وشرح لنا وفصل لنا ما كان اجمل في القران وابهم في القران السنه هي تفصل من القران وهي تشرع من القران وهي تبين ما جاء في القران وفي القران مبهم وفي القران مجمل وفي القران محكم وفي القران ولكن جاء في الحديث بيان وتخصيص واستثناء وهناك كان تقييد هنا كان تقييد للمترك وكان تخصيص للعام وجاءت كل هذا الشيء يقال لها السنه قاديه على القران وليس القران القادي على السنه ليس لنا ان نفهم مراد القران ومفاهيم القران ومطلوب القران بدون السنه ولكن ينبغي لنا ويمكن لنا ان نفهم ما جاء في السنه بدون القران ولذلك قال الامام شافعي في الام هكذا جاء عندنا الوحيين وكذلك نقل الامام سيوطي عن الامام ابي المعالي الجويني هو قال كلام الله المنزل هو قسمان جاء الوحي بالقسمين قسم رب القران وقسم ثاني الحديث فان جبريل كان ينزل بالسنه كما كان ينزل عليه بالقران فالقران هو روايه كلام الله لفظا والسنه هي روايه كلام الله معنى فاما المقصود من الاول اي وحي القران هو التلاوه والتعبد والمقصود من الثاني اي السنه هو الروايه والتنقل ويقتضي فاثبات القران هو يقتضي اثبات السنه وانكار السنه يقتضي انكار القران لو انكر لو انكرنا هدية السنة انكرنا هدية القرآن لأن جاء في القرآن الكريم في المكامات عديدة وجعل الله تبارك وتعالى طاعة الله تعالى وطاعة الرسول اي هدية القرآن وهدية السنة في مكان واحد وإذا قال الله تبارك وتعالى ما جعل قول احد من البشر قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قول الرسول ما جعله مثل قول احد من البشر انما جعل قوله تعالى اذا قال وما ينطق عن الهوى ان هو الا وحي يوحى وهكذا ما جعل فعل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مثل فعل احد من البشر بل جعله فعله تعالى كما قال وما رميت اذ رميت ولكن الله رمى فما جعل الله تبارك وتعالى رضا الرسول كرضا احد من البشر بل جعل رضاه رضاه الله تبارك وتعالى اذا قال الله ورسوله احق ان يرضوه هكذا جعل اطاع الرسول مثل اطاع الله تعالى اذا قال ولو انهم رضوا ما اعطاهم الله ورسوله وكذلك جعل الله تبارك وتعالى فضل الرسول كانما هو فضل الله اذا قال قالوا حسبنا الله سيؤتينا الله من فضله ورسوله وهكذا في اغناء قال ما نقموا الا ان اغناهم الله ورسوله وهكذا في العنام وهكذا في الادب وهكذا في التعزيم قال لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله وهكذا في البيع ان الذين يبايعونك انما يبايعون الله 
من الله وهكذا في الدعاء يا ايها الذين امنوا استجيبوا لله وللرسول اذا دعاكم وما قال اذا دعاكم ذكر اسمين الله ورسوله ولكن اورد الضمير للواحد فقال استجيبوا لله وللرسول اذا دعاكم وما قال اذا دعاكم وقال الله تبارك وتعالى هكذا اتي الله واتي الرسول فان تولوه وهكذا في المشاقه والماسيه وبراءه واذان ولذلك قال العلامه ابن تيميه في سالم المسلول هو قال وفي هذا المكان بيان للتلازم الحقين وقال ان جهه حرمته تعالى وجهه حرمه رسوله جهه واحده فمن اذى الرسول فقد اذى الله ومن اطاعه فقد اطاع الله وقال العلامه ابن تيميه لان الامه لا يصلون ما بينهم وبين ربهم الا بواسطه الرسول ليس لاحد منهم طريق غيره ولا سبب سواه وقال ابن تيميه قد اقامه الله تعالى مقام نفسه اقام الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم مقام نفسه في امره ونهيه واخباره وبيانه فلا يجوز ان يفرق بين الله ورسوله في شيء من هذه الامور فجعل اخبار الله اخبار الرسول هو اخبار الله بيان الرسول هو بيان الله وامر الرسول هو امر الله ونهي الرسول هو نهي الله so these are the basic the significance and relevance of quran and sunnah together <laughs> that's why almighty allah states a holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explained the same thing for us and he said qad taraktu wa rawahu imam malik fil muwatta wa qala qad taraktu fikum amarain lan tadillu ma tamassaktum bihima kitab sunnah an nabi these are two major things and holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam reported narrated by huzaifa this is this is reported by muwatta imam malik and imam hakim an nabi huraira and reported by abu huraira again hadith is muttafaq alay holy prophet said qala man ata'ani faqad ata allah wa man asani faqad asa allah wa again reported by huzaifa qala anna al-amana nazalat min as-sama'i fi jazr al-qulub qulub ar-rijal nazala al-qur'an fa qara'u al-qur'an walimu min as-sunnah so there are two basic sources and authority text quran revealed by almighty god and we are supposed to learn it and understand its meaning and application according to the changing circumstances of our time because quran is forever it was not for the days of the companions so quran is a living document a living guide a living text which has an ability a constant capability to solve every single issue or problem or complication which we are facing today and same position has been allocated and assigned to the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he is khatamun nabiyyin and his sunnah is the khatamatu sunnah it will continue to the day of judgment in the same way when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it is reported by ibn aun in sahih bukhari qala salasun uhibbuhunna li nafsi wa li ikhwani and first thing is hazihi sunnah he said hazihi sunnah ان يتعلموها ويسالوا عنها التعلم في السنه so if you read into sunnah and derive the meanings of sunnah and derive the wisdom from sunnah the reasoning of the sunnah and try to apply it in changing circumstances of the times so it becomes fiqh sunnah this is al fiqh and then he said al quran ان يتفهموه ويسالوا عنه second is quran and quran does not need only to recite but you have to receive the faham of quran so receiving the faham from quran it again becomes fiqh ul quran so by combining all these three if one is one text is the quran second text is the sunnah and third text is relevant is the faham ul quran wa sunnah that faham ul quran wa sunnah is al fiqh which relates to ul al amr and which has been commanded by quran fasalu ahl al zikr in kuntum la ta'lamun these are the zikr ul al amr in ilm 
So these are the people who give us the Fahmul Quran, the Hikmatul Quran, the Hikmatul Sunnah, and that is known as Al, al Fiqh, which was given by the Aimma Fuqaha, Imam Azam Abu Hanifa, or Imam Malik, or Imam Shafi, or Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, or other great Aimma of Salaf al Salihin after the, there is a continuity of Aimma who have been communicating the Faham of Quran and Sunnah and Fiqh to us. So we have, it is binding on us to try to understand the meanings of the text of Quran through Al-Fiqh wal hikmah To try to understand the meanings of Sunnah through Al-Fiqh Sunnah and those people, how they have interpreted and communicated the message to us. So this Quran, Holy Quran has categorically decreed and prohibited us, don't follow their whims. When we talk of violence, for example, and justice and violence, I will come to that. Whole Quran is based on the concept of justice. And justice with a specific reference to bring peace to Afghanistan. Not only justice within Muslim community, justice for the whole of humankind, justice for the whole world of humanity, whether they are Muslim or non Muslim. Justice is a universal concept. It is a global concept. Justice is a totality. There is no exception for anybody. Justice has to be available for every person, Muslim or non Muslim. Quran says in Surah Al Ma'idah, verse 8, very significant thing. Two articles are included in this verse one common, second specific. Stated, Ya Yuhalladina Amanu, Kuru Abba Mina Lillahi. Shuhada Abil Qisr. This is the common article of justice. Stated, O oh, you who believe, stand for God, witness in justice. This is the common article of the significance of justice for everyone. Now in the same verse, next words are very specific for non-Muslims. Even this is Islam. Islam is a religion for mankind. For humanity, it is not a religion sent only for Meccans and Medinans, not only for Arabs, not only for the Muslims. This is a religion, Ya Yuhannas, Inni Rasulullah ilaykum jamiya, for the whole of mankind. Our Prophet Sallallahu he was made mercy for the whole mankind. In the same way, as Almighty Allah's Lordship is for the whole mankind. He is Rabbul Alameen. And our Prophet, peace be upon him, is Rahmatul Lilal. So Quran says, Wala yajri mannakum shana'anukum min ala Allah ta'ati. The second article of justice. He said, be just. And do not let the hatred of a people. Do not let the hatred of a people. And of a people means non-Muslims. Those who are fighting against you. Those whom you were at war with them, the people at war, even Muharibin, this is Quran is mentioning about. He said, do not let the hatred of a people, those who stop you from the entrance of Kaaba and Haram. So this kind of hatred even should not prevent you from being just. Even hatred of a nation of the non-Muslim should not instigate you to act in an unjust way. The justice should prevail in every situation, whether you are dealing with Muslim community or non-Muslim community. Whether you are dealing with the people whom you are and have entered into any treaty of peace, or even you are at war. Even during the time of war and during the warfare, justice is a great quality which cannot be discarded for. The Quran says, Ehgelu Uvaqrabu li taqwa. And be just, that is closer to the righteousness. Then again commandment. Justice and non-violence has been connected together, has been put together. There can be no justice with violence. And there can be no non-violence without justice. These are together. Quran says in Surah al mumtai verse 8, La yanhaakum allahu لَمْ يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَلَمْ يُخْرِجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ أَنْ تَبَرُّوهُمْ وَتُقْسِطُوا إِلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ 
Yohibul Moksiti. A great emphasis has been placed here. Said God does not forbid you to behave righteously, kindly, and justly to those people, non-Muslims. Almighty Allah does not forbid you to behave kindly, righteously, and justly with those non-Muslim people who did not fight against you because of your religion and those who did not expel you from your houses, those who did not impose a bar of aggression on you, and those who did not expel you from your jail, did not drive you out from your houses. If they had not committed these two crimes, then God's commandment is even to behave with them kindly, righteously and justly. And treating with them justly, God loves the just. And then very significant verse, the same verse continues. Quran says, Innama in the same verse, Innama yanhaakumullah anil ladhina qatalukum fiddin wa akhrajukum min diyarikum wa zaharu ala ikhwanikum. Almighty Allah does not allow you to be friend with those those who fought against you, who imposed war on you because of your religion of Islam. Those who drove you out of your land and those who helped somebody who attacked on you. If these three crimes are not available, so Almighty Allah says that you are under a commandment to behave with them with justice and righteousness and piety. So this was the criterion given by Quran. Again it is stated, وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّذِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَالَمُونَ Quran says that you are not allowed to dispute those people who are people of book except with better means, with dignity, with decency. Unless it be with those persons who inflicted wrong on you or injury on you or committed aggression on you. So here the one thing is very clear in the light of many of Quranic verses, I quoted just three. These are that what is the basic relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims? Original relationship. This is the basic question. Al Adawa, this is not the original relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. Al Mukhalafa is not the original relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. Al Muharaba is not a basic relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. And in the same way, Al Musada or Al Musalama. It is also not the basic relationship with any two nations. So what would be the basic relationship? There is Al-Buhaya, Al-Hiyad, neutrality. There can be five kinds of relationships. Either enmity, war, or hostility, or friendship and association, or treaty. None of them. Two are positive, two are negative. The basic relationship of a Muslim and non-Muslim nation is neutrality. Al-Hayyad, Al-Muhayyada. You are neutral. And Al-Aslu fil Ashiya al ibaha This is the original basis where you have to start your relationship. If somebody works enemically, attacks on you, becomes, commits an act of aggression, so he becomes your enemy. Now you have entered into a state of hostility or a state of power. And if somebody enters with you in a treaty of peace or treaty of reconciliation, so now you are in Musadama or al Musad. And if there is no friendship, there is no enmity, no war, no hostility, and no treaty of peace, nothing, then you are in a position, a statement or relationship of neutrality. The UN no has taken the position of neutrality being every single nation of the world, being member of UNO, through that multilateral agreement. So every single country originally has entered into the state of either neutrality or a statement of multinational treaty of peace and reconciliation. Unless there is a war is imposed on you and that is war of aggression. If there is a war of aggression, every single Muslim, every single society, every single 
uh, nation, every single country has an absolute right of self-defense. You can fight in defense. So that's why Quran says, and this was where, this was where the fighting and war was allowed. The first single permission was given. And it was made conditional. One article. The Annahum Zulimu is the second article in this verse. And third, Allahina Ukhriju min diyari bihayri hakim. This is the third article. And fourth, so this Quranic verse have five articles which explains the internationality of a relationship from nation to nation. Quran says permission to fight in defense is granted to you. You see how just divine revelations are, how just Islamic teachings are, how just dignified, peaceful, based on human dignity and human peace, the Islamic and Quranic and Hadithic teachings are. Quran says permission to fight in defense is granted to those with the zinal, those against whom the war of aggression has been imposed. So it means if the war of aggression has not been imposed on you, you are not allowed to take arms. And this order has been granted to the states, to the governments, not to individuals, not to the groups, and not to organizations. This should be, it should be very clear. If every individual wants to take wrong benefit of the Quranic commandment, of the difa, and the defense war of defense, or every single group and organization wants to be, take the position and authority of the state, then it means we will create a global anarchy, a disorder. We should remind the Quranic words of Surah An-Nisa, where it was revealed, You know, this verse was revealed, the Holy Prophet spent 10 years in Medinan period, but not a single companion or a group of companions took wrong benefit of this commandment. No group was allowed to attack on their own, on the Meccans, because brutalities were being committed. Persecutions were being committed. The Muslims who were there, they were being killed, they were being hurt. So not a single companion or a single group took illegal benefit of this and nobody attacked on them. This was a commandment for the army of the Medina, for Holy Prophet This was his duty as a collective duty of the Muslim community headed by the Prophet Muhammad The same way, says, if there is a war of aggression is imposed on you, so Muslim as a whole or a state, the authority is vested in it, they are allowed to fight in defense against the war of aggression. Second, Quran says, Second condition. Why? Because they are oppressed. So under a state of oppression, if anybody has imposed a war of aggression and oppression on you, only you are allowed to fight your defense. Fighting for defense of Afghanistan is permissible for Quran. Fighting for defense of Iraq, fighting for defense of Palestine, fighting for defense of every single land of Muslim Ummah. If a war of aggression is imposed on them, this is a dutiful uh, right, a lawful right of every single Muslim, every single citizen to fight for their defense. But it does not mean that you should start attacking the civilian population of non-Muslim countries or civilian population of other Muslim countries as a event. You should start the suicide bombing. You should start the killing of the non-Muslim, non-combatants, those who are not part of the Yuqatilu, they are not allowed, even they belong to Darul Harb. This is categorically mentioned by all Aima of Africa. Then Quran says, if this war of defense was not allowed, then Lahuddimat Sabami wa Biyon wa Salabatun wa Masajid. Equal sanctity of the places of worship belonging to all religions have been granted. All mentioned. Quran says, even the cloisters, 
the monasteries, the synagogues, the churches and the mosques, they would have been demolished, abundantly demolished, and there Almighty Allah's name is commemorated. So these were the basic teachings. That there are limitations by Quran, by Sunnah and Aima Mushtahideen about the jihad, about the war of defense, about the self-defense, which does not, even the war of self-defense does not allow any act of violence. It is based on the act of justice and non-violence. During a battlefield, during a warfare, Holy Prophet ﷺ, it is narrated in Sahih and particularly details come in Sabarani also. Naha Rasulullah says, Aman Katrin Nisa Ibar Vilda. During a battlefield, when he saw a non Muslim lady and a child, they were killed, assassinated. He said, Who has killed them? He prohibited. Then he said, La Takturu Walidan Matifalan, Wala Walidan Tifalan, Wala Sahiran, Wala Mrahatan, Wala Shaykhan Kabira, Wala Tukhabiruna Ainan, Wala Takiruna Shajaratan. Illa shajaran yamna ukum kitala. Wala tumasiru bi adamijan wala bahimatin. Wala takbiru wala takhullu. Don't kill any infant, young child, a woman, old man. Don't cause fountains to dry. Do not destroy the trees. Mutilate neither a human or an animal. Don't break the promise or don't breach the trust. These are the conditions of justice even during a battle, during the warfare. And then only Prophet said, La taqturu ashab al-sabami. Do not kill those who came to the monastery. Ala la yuqtalu rahib. Be there no monk or priest is to be killed. Ittakulla fil fallahim. Wala taqturu hum. Wala taqturu tujar al-mushrikeen. Wala yuqtalu rasul. Fear God regarding the farmers, agriculturists, the growers. Do not kill them. Do not kill the merchants among the pagans because they are the ones who are providing economic life to the society. And do not kill the ambassadors. This is the Holy Prophet said. Wala yuzafaku ala jarihin, wala yuktal wasirun, wala yutbao mudbiru. The injured person or prisoner of war should not be killed. And the one who flees should not be pursued. So this is the standard given by the Muslim world. I would like to send my message through this conference to non-Muslim and Western world. Those who are trying to propagate a hatred because of a wrongful act of a minority, those who are killers and transgressors and, and terrorists, because of their wrong criministic activities, to combine the terrorism and Islam, to combine the terrorism with the Muslim community, it would be absolutely an act of injustice. Islam has nothing to do with injustice. Islam has no concern with tyranny, no concern with violence, no concern with terrorism. And Islam has no link with killing of mankind. Islam is the only religion who protected the life of mankind indiscriminately. The first religion on the world who protected the dignity of mankind, who protected the equality for mankind, who protected the social, economic and political and legal justice for mankind, and who prohibited every kind of act of violence for the mankind indiscriminately whether they were Muslims or non-Muslims. And Islam is the religion when Holy Prophet ﷺ final words, when he established an Islamic society of Medina after migration, and he wrote a constitution which is known as as sahifa So in Article 28 of as sahifa Misat al-Madina, Balazri says, Imam, Imam Ubaidullah bin Salam has quoted, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Isham has quoted, Ibn Zinjavay has quoted, Ibn Kasir and Ibn Asir, everybody has quoted that in Article 28, Holy Prophet categorically mentioned, Inna Yahuda Bani Auf, Ummadum Ma'al Mu'mini. Please concentrate, these are my last words of speech. The word written by Holy Prophet in the Constitution. Inna Yahuda Bani Auf, Ummadum Ma'al Mu'mini. And then all of their allies, he mentioned eight or ten tribes. Those who are allied to Banu Auf said everybody has the status of being Ummah along with the Muslims. So he created a single unity in nationality, single Ummah, and included the Yahud along with the Muslims. And said, but they will practice independently their own religion, as it was stated, Lakum Deenukum Waliyadeen in Quran. 
and Muslim will practice freely their own religion. So Islam is the religion which granted freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of every kind of communication. But at the same time, Islam is a religion of peace, the religion of tranquility, the religion of brotherhood, the religion of protection, the religion of providing guarantees of human rights, the religion of tolerance, the religion of happiness, the religion of justice, the religion of every kind of socio-economic, political equality and legal equality for the mankind, irrespective of their race, their color and their creed and religion. So Islam is never to be blamed. Islam is the sole only religion which came in this world and eliminated all kinds of indiscrimination saying kullukum banu adam wa adam min turab la fadra li arabiyan ala ajamiyan wa la li ajamiyan ala arabiyan illa bi taqwa he totally eliminated all indiscrimination and provided the mankind with equality with justice with tolerance with peace that's why the name of islam was granted Islam from Sil, and Iman came from Amr, and Ihsan came from Husn. So Islam from the beginning to the end, it is totally peace and security, and it is a total beauty, and it is total Husn in every aspect of our character, whether individual life or collective or international. Thank you very much. یاو جهان من نه د جناب مولی سید نه فکر کوم چې مونږ ته به خدای تعالی نعمت را اوس را برخه کړی ده چې د دوی بیانیه مو اورید او واقعا چې ډیر طرف نه مودی او عالمانو مونږ په زیږ دقیقه وخت لرو د سوالونو د پاره او ډیر سوالونه هم را ټول کړی دي نو یو په یو کوشش کوو هغه سوالونه چې د دوی په دې موضوع باندې زیات ارتباط درلودو هغه سوالونه به دوی ته په مخ کو او هیله لرو چې لنډه درو د سیفټي او تاوزنز لایف ان سپایټ اف سیوینګ مای لایف آی کین سیکریفایس مای لایف فار ملینز اف دی مسلمز سو دی شوډ ګیټ اپ اند دی شوډ سټیټ کلیکټیو انسټیټ اف فیرینګ دی لایف ویز ان هینډ اف الله دی نایټ ویچ آر مای ټی الله هاز ریټن ڈاون ان یور فیت دیٹ یو ویل گو سپینڈ دیٹ نایټ ان دی گریو نو بڈی کین سیو یو فرام اینٹرینگ ان دیٹ گریو And if Almighty Allah has written that you have to spend this night on the face of earth, nobody can push you against the Allah's degree into that grave. We have a trust in Almighty Allah's fate and destination. It is the life is in the hands of Allah. If collectively the scholars stand up, their remaining silent is a form of crime. If they remain silent, and that those persons who are terrorists, very few, but they are vocal. their voices are heard everywhere and unfortunately since they are radical they are vocal they are speaking everywhere they have been wrongly taken as the representatives of pakistan i have visited those elvishers of extremists they are taken as the islamic representatives of in us they are taken as representatives of in england they are taken as representatives in australia they are taking as representatives of muslims in european countries why because they are only the people who speak on television they write they form organization they are vocal since they are vocal but minority their vocal voice has given them a status of representative but overwhelming majority of muslim umma those who muslim umma who are peaceful they reject act of terrorism they reject act of suicide but they are silent So silence had made them as if they are living in graves. They should come out of the grave of silence. And that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kalimah to hakke in the Sultan in Jairin. This this is the time of standing up and say the kalimah of hak against those who are terrorists and the killers of mankind and enemies of mankind, so that their voice is heard and the humanity and the world at large may become to know. that these are the real representatives of muslim umma and not those people who are living in minority they have hijacked islam they have hijacked the term of jihad they have hijacked the term of quran and sunnah they have nothing to do with the terminology of islam you are the successors of islam those who are the peaceful you are the successors of quran and sunnah and you are the successors of imam abu hanifa malik ahmad bin hanbal and chafi and all saints and scholars 
So if you stand up and become vocal, then you would be taken as true representative of Muslim Ummah, inshaAllah. خدا کنم از سوالا تکراری نباشد سوال است مگه در این اواخر رهبر جماعت العلمای پاکستان فتوای صادر کرده مبنی بر جهاد and at that time I went visited Kabul with my 15 or 16 leaders of Minhaj al-Quran to help rehabilitation process as much as we could and after that some people belonging to Taliban they came to me, I offered them that I am ready to give you three to six months to train you what kind of constitution Afghanistan needs for Islamic implementation, what kind of peaceful, moderate vision Afghanistan needs for future. But peace and moderation was not included in their agenda, the Taliban agenda. They established an extremistic view, depriving the women from their rights, pushing them back to the homes, depriving them from education, and creating a wrong image about Islam, about women, about children. It was totally against a moderation and tolerant society given by Almighty Allah and Prophet Muhammad. So we need for Afghanistan a moderate vision, a progressive vision, a peaceful vision, where everybody can live with fulfillment of basic human rights, where the life, honor, property of every person is respected where Muslim and non-Muslim gets every kind of freedom of expression and religion, where there is a moderate vision, where there is a, a connection between Afghan society and the world. This is the world of global interaction, where Afghanistan would play as an important player of the global community. So we have, we have to make Afghanistan as an agent of the global and a part of the global community with a moderate, peaceful vision of Islam. We should try to establish science and technology and education and peaceful ways and means and propagate peace and we should fight against hatred and sectarianism and extremism. This is my message and if we act on these ways and we get rid of extremistic people from our land, inshallah this would be in the benefit of Islam, Afghanistan, Pakistan and all of Muslim Ummah. One is misunderstanding Another, I feel fear of death. Muslim countries in Afghanistan and Pakistan particularly, the governments have failed to provide protection to the rights of scholars and people. They can't provide protection. And if anybody gives any issue, fatwa, he is killed. Lot many people have been killed. Even I have been announced one ten million, ten million dollars on my head. It has been announced. Many times it has come on the different in CNN it has announced, in BBC it has come, in French television, in, in Canadian television channels, in Russian television channels, it has been announced many times, from $5 million to $10 million. So people have fear of death, and everybody cannot act the same way. For example, I think, if I, if I am killed in this situation, so maybe Almighty Allah forgives me for, for the sake of the peace of mankind, and I get a better place than in this world. So I trust in Almighty God. But you can't expect this reaction from every single person. Society and the government should come up to provide the security to the people. Since they see anybody who announces this kind of fatwa, he is killed, assassinated. And then in Pakistan particularly, up till today, thousands of killers and suicide bombers and terrorists are under arrest. Thousands. But none of them has been identified. He is not brought on the television. Nobody in the government and interior ministry and agencies tell the people in the nation who this person is. Where does he belong? Of course, he belongs to certain mosque. He goes to any madrasa. He is a student of a certain teacher, any scholar. He gets teaching from any particular religious center. He, somebody has made up his mind and he has taken up to this level of suicide committee. If you go into these aspects and thorough investigation, Everybody would be exposed. Which sect and which group does he belong to? But always their interests always cover and conceal. He is never exposed. If this is the policy, the terrorists are not exposed and they are not taken to the task. And nobody is ever hanged and got the punishment. No, the police provides very, very weak evidence and in the courts they are always released. If this is the situation, 
So the sinful people are released and the innocent people are taken to the task. If there is no rule of law and no equality of law, so the people they are afraid of this issue, this kind of fitwa. So we have to bring this kind of change in our culture also, that is socio, political and legal culture, so that the people may feel that they are safe and secure. So one reason was lack of clarity on the subject, academic and jurisprudential. Other is fear. But fear can only be removed in bringing trust in Almighty Allah and by loving the death and not preferring it from